Hello and welcome to the last part of my April's repair marathon. This video will probably come out already in May, but it is only because it costs a lot of time to cut the videos. The repair marathon itself happened on one weekend in the beginning of the April already. Anyway, before I will get to the next board, I would like to come back to the PCI486 main board from the last video. There, I made a mistake which I would like to correct this time. If you saw my last video, maybe you remember that beside RTC module, I also installed a keyboard controller on that board, which seemed to be desoldered previously by somebody. Well, maybe you remember that the solder pads for the RTC module were slightly damaged, and I said that the solder pads for the keyboard controller, on the other hand, were in great condition. Well, this seems to have had a reason. As I told, I was doing this marathon on one weekend and I didn't have time to investigate too much about the boards. However, as I was experimenting later with the faster CPUs on this board, I realized that some jumpers were not documented properly. So I went online to search for some more documentation. Doing so, I apparently stumbled across some other images of this or similar boards. Then I realized that some of them didn't have a keyboard controller at all. You see, usually the manufacturers cover the unused or optional pads with solder. And on this board, all the pads and holes were covered indeed, however, the ones for the keyboard controller not. What gave me a misleading feeling that there is a keyboard controller missing. Such keyboard controllers were common for PCs up to 486. In very late 486, Pentiums and later machines, the keyboard controller disappeared in the higher integrated chipsets, just as it was on this mainboard probably. I removed the keyboard controller and followed the traces once again up into the chipsets indeed. Without the controller in the socket, this mainboard worked just fine as well. Luckily, it didn't disturb the system somehow, but it was totally redundant. So I removed the socket again, and this time I covered the pads with some solder to avoid any irritation in the future. Now to the actual star of today's video, the Gigabyte GA486VF. Again, one interesting 486 mainboard with support for 486 CPUs with up to 100 MHz, but probably even more. It has a voltage regulator and should therefore support 3 volt CPUs as well. The cache ICs are missing. The PCB itself seems to be a little bit bent, what can sometimes mean micro cracks in the solder joints. This board has even more physical damages, like this battery, which was halfway ripped from the board. Furthermore, in this area there must have been a hit since one transistor has been ripped from the board. These two transistors are responsible for switching between the battery and the PCU power supply for the RTC module and to keep BIO settings in memory. You can find such a pair of transistors on almost every mainboard, even today. On older mainboards, up to 486, they were almost always located right below of the battery and in front of the ISO slots. Back then, they were mostly through hole parts, like you see on this main board. However, on our Gigabyte board, these two transistors are SMDs. Luckily, this board provides also optional pads for the same transistors in through hole housing. All these damages shouldn't affect the basic functionality of the main board, so let's see if it's working at all. First of all, I will need a CPU. As I told, this main board supports 3 volt CPUs as well, so I actually can take any of these. The easiest thing is to use this one because it has already a cooler, it is an Intel 486TX266 CPU and should give us a good start. And I will install 4 memory modules, I think these are 4 MB each, this should be more than enough. I also add post analyzer card and APC speaker, this should help us to see if any activity happens. I already set all the jumpers and hopefully in the right way. Let's see. Yeah, and nothing happens. The post analyzer doesn't have any numbers on it as well. Let's see if we have power. Yes, in the cache sockets I can measure 5 volts. The CPU doesn't seem to get warm though. Since it has a cooler, it maybe absorbs the temperature too fast. I will replace the CPU with another one without a cooler. Maybe I can feel then if it gets warm. And... Yes, it is definitely getting warmer. Okay, on this board the jumpers are set to 256 kilobyte of cache, but we have no cache ICs installed yet. Some boards don't like it. So let's add some cache ICs. I will add some dioxide to clean the contacts. Who knows how long they have been exposed. 
By the way, if you have a main board with DIP32 sockets for cache ICs, it is possible to use DIP28 ICs there as well. You just have to insert the ICs from the end of the socket. The longer sockets can be used to hold 64K ICs as well, where DIP28 ICs can be up to 32 kilobyte in capacity. Well, adding cache ICs didn't help, but maybe I made some mistake with the jumpers. So off camera, I removed all jumpers from the board and reinstalled them one by one again, guided by the manual. The CPU with the cooler is back in place, and as you see, the main board finally posts. I guess I made a mistake with the jumpers previously. The main board complained about missing video adapter, so I added one VLB graphics card and an IDE controller with a compact flash card in case we will be able to boot. Well, the main board posts, but it seems not to react on keyboard input and it hangs right before it should start to boot the operation system. But at least it posts. It is already good news. And one more test. Let's see if the keyboard gets powered at all. And as you see, when I turn on the power, the keyboard LEDs are all lighting for a brief moment, so power is probably not the issue. Good, let's do some soldering. As you maybe remember, I got the main boards for this repair marathon from Ulf from DOS Reloaded Community. The state of these main boards meets the description of Ulf pretty well. He said that he already replaced the keyboard connector. The solder blobs look a bit suspicious, and since I need to solder a little bit more anyway, I will resolder the keyboard connector again, just to be sure that there are no cracks in the solder joints. The traces under the connector are looking clean, so at least it looks like there shouldn't be any continuity issues. I will remove the battery from the PCB completely. First of all, it is already halfway off, and second, it could leak in the future and make a lot of damage. Now to the transistors. First, I will clean the pads where one SMD transistor is missing and also remove the other transistor which is still on the PCB. You need a pair of transistors here, one PNP and one NPN bipolar. I have a pair which should fit a 2N3904 NPN and 2N3906 PNP. To know which one goes into which hole, I just looked at another mainboard where the same transistors were used and placed them accordingly. Good, so far the system is still posting and the keyboard still doesn't work. Let's take a closer look at the controller. As I showed in the introduction video to this marathon, this main board has a keyboard controller which I never saw before. The model is LT38C41L. It is much smaller than the usual 40 pin controller, which is used on the most other main boards of that time. I tried to find any documentation of this controller, but I didn't find anything, so I will have to find out the pinout using a multimeter. At least the pins I need to know. As you can see, around the small keyboard controller I see there are solder pads around for the usual 40 pin big one. I found that the pin 20 of the small IC corresponds to the first pin of the big 40 pin IC, which means clock. The pin 19 corresponds to data and pin 39 on the bigger chip. Good, let's measure what we have on the clock pin when turning on the power. Okay, that's odd. It remains low all the time. And what happens with data? It remains high all the time. This doesn't look right as well. Just to give you an idea how it should look like, here is another main board which is working. Look what happens with the clock signal when I turn the power on. It is low for a short period, and then it goes high and gives some impulses later. This is not at all what we see on the other board. Let's make some measurements. On the clock pin we have a resistance value of almost a kilo ohm to the 5 volt rail. That could be okay. And to the ground there is only 460 ohm. I think that this value is too low. If it acts as a pull down resistor, it would pull the clock signal too aggressively to the ground. Usually the pull down resistance should be at least 1 kilo ohm. More common are even higher values, up to 10 kilo ohm. Let's desolder the small keyboard controller. Yeah, now without the controller I see, the resistance from clock pin to the ground is at 5 kilo ohm, which is a more appropriate value. And measuring directly on the IC between the clock on pin 20 and ground on pin 11, you can see that we are getting somewhat around 500 ohm.
It could be right, but for me it just looks wrong. I would expect here multiple killer arms. Okay, let's install a socket for a common 40 pin IC instead. I already opened the pinholes for the socket. As I explained in the previous videos, the keyboard controllers are derived from the Intel's 8042, which was originally used in the IBM AT. And I have a full bunch of them, so let's take the same one which I removed again from the previous board. Let's turn the power on again and see if we will get any difference. Aha! Uh -huh. You see how clock signal went from low to high and made some pulses afterwards? That is exactly how it should behave. As you see, when I press some buttons on the keyboard, the clock signal pulses again and again. This does look a lot better. And what happens with data signal? Yep, this one pulses as well. Okay, I plugged in the monitor and look what happens. I was able to enter BIOS, but here the keyboard stopped working. I hear PC speaker making sounds when I press the keys. This means at least that there is something happening between the keyboard and the PC, but something is still very wrong. The keyboard, which I am usually using, is an USB one connected through a PS2 adapter. I connected another keyboard, which is purely a T1, and this keyboard seems to work better. I can navigate through BIOS and it is mostly working, but has some glitches, missing some keys and such things. Furthermore, look at this. When I press numlock, either nothing happens or all LEDs light up briefly and then reset again. That is really strange. So, I tried different keyboard controllers I have. Some didn't work at all with this main board and some produced weird things, like beeping PC speaker or flashing the LEDs all the time. So what happens here actually? Remember how I said that such keyboard controllers are all derived from the original Intel's 8042 controller? Well, that is true, and for many main boards they are interchangeable, except in cases where they aren't. To understand why, we have to take a brief but slightly more detailed look at what such 8042 IC is. Actually, this is not just a keyboard controller. It is a full-blown microcontroller which talks to the rest of the main board using a particular protocol. This means that this microcontroller has its own ROM inside with a specific program to handle the keyboard communication and translate it to the system. This program is in the most cases standard stuff which is taken by the mainboard's manufacturers off the shelf. In particular, when a manufacturer selects which BIOS to take, he also decides which microcontroller will be taken to handle the keyboard I.O. and how it will be programmed. Actually, the BIOS has to fit the program in the microcontroller and other way around. Also, different microcontrollers can have different timings and so the signals coming out of it can be incompatible with the other infrastructure. Well, as I said, since the most manufacturers take a solution from the shelf, the keyboard controller are usually interchangeable, but probably not in this case, and all the controllers I have at my hand don't work in this machine. However, during this marathon, as I was working on the other main board from my last video, I realized that it had a 40-pin controller with a model number very similar to the one which was installed in this main board previously. LT38C41 is a number, where the small one is LT38C41L. That's an interesting coincidence. Let's borrow this controller and see if it works better than the others. And success! I can enter BIOS and navigate without any glitches. And look at this, the numpad LED lights up properly when I press the button. So either the program in this microcontroller fits accidentally, or this mainboard has a strict timing requirements, which only this model of the microcontrollers can deliver. Okay, at least we have a working keyboard now to move on. So back to the second problem. When I turn on the mainboard, it posts, shows the system configuration table and then suddenly hangs with a cursor blinking in the end of the table. Usually, when the system is ready to boot, the cursor should jump right below of the table and the system should start to access the drives to boot the operation system. This doesn't go so far here. Talking from experience, this exact behavior, where the cursor hangs inside of the table right in the end, is in the most cases due to cache issues. 
If you remember, this board was without any cache ICs as I got it. I installed the missing cache ICs because I thought that it wouldn't boot because of that. Well, let's remove all the cache ICs again and see where we will get you. The main board posts. Let me make some hard drive settings. It says cache memory none and success! The main board came over the point and could boot into DOS. Season 4 works. Benchmark says 94 points, which are a bit low. Even without a cache, I would expect it to be around 110. But well. Yay, and Doom runs as well. So off camera, I tried all kind of things. I tried different cache ICs, different configurations with 256k, with 128k in second bank and 128k in the first bank, different jumper settings, but nothing worked. As soon as I had any cache ICs installed, the board refused to boot instantly. Old electrolytic capacitors can be a culprit for such errors, but this board has only three such caps altogether. I desoldered and tested them and all three caps were just fine. I installed new ones anyway and as expected this didn't help as well. Unfortunately, I have to make a break at this point. I couldn't get this board fully working so far. The cache issues seem to have some deeper roots and it looks like the investigation would be just too much for now. I honestly invested already hours of work into this board and at least for this marathon I am now out of time. The problem with the missing keyboard controller remains, because I surely had to put back the borrowed controller into the original place so currently it makes it even more complicated to investigate further on this. But hey, at least the keyboard issues were solved. I just need a replacement for the controller. The physical damage on this board was also fixed. The board is working without the cache and I am pretty sure that it is also possible to get the cache working again. But this is a topic for another day. In the end, as for the whole marathon, I am quite happy with the result. Four main boards out of five are fully working again and one board is halfway working. I think this is a result which should make any retro heart happy. And I hope I could make you happy with this repair marathon as well. If you liked it, you know what to do, and if not as well. And this was it for today and for this April's repair marathon. Please stay tuned for the next videos, and I say thank you and goodbye.